Good afternoon, and uh, it's good to see you. Uh, virtually, it, best intentions was, would be to come up to that in person, uh, but you mentioned all that congressional time, and I spent the last two days on Capitol Hill. About five hours of testimony will uh, we'll do uh, wonders for your sleep, not, not so much maybe. Uh, but thank you. It's a really important topic. Uh, it really is, uh, and, and I'm glad you're tackling it, and what do we do about it is really the key here. I've gotten some feedback of how it's been addressed the last couple of days, lots of discussion on the threats, and they're real, and we're seeing them each and every day here in the Southcom area of responsibility uh, because it's part of that global threat network that, that constitutes um, the daily attacks in cyber. I think about competition and the word competition and as the senior military assistant to Secretary of Defense Mattis, when we were drafting the national defense strategy, ensuring that competition was a key element of that was very important. And then how do we expand the competitive space with respect to that competition? And that was the number one strategic concept that the then SecDef wanted to embed into that, expand the competitive space, do what we do best uh, as uh, free democracies in the US and, and do it better and in different ways and not necessarily just geographically. And this is a big part of that field. And I, I, so I flinch when I hear people say, well, it's a new domain. I think that's part of our problem. We've got we've to get over the new domain piece and get into the regular order of this as a full-fledged war fighting domain. I also think that what I see is not competition in cyber, it's conflict in cyber. The blatant theft of intellectual property, the blatant theft of technology, the blatant theft uh, of identity, the, uh, the deep intelligence probes well behind uh, well beyond uh, anything ever seen before. You all talked about solar winds and, and that list is extremely long. The blatant use of cyber uh, and influence to change the contours of elections. We have a large number of elections in this hemisphere this year. And in a recent election, we saw active, active, active uh, activity uh, originating from Venezuela designed to ensure that that election was not free and fair. And free and fair elections are what every democracy deserves and what we all uh, work together as leaders of strong institutions uh, try to achieve. And um, inside Venezuela, you have Russia, China, and Iran actively working uh, to help Maduro in cyber. And I won't get into more details beyond that, but there's, it's not a new relationship. It's been a, at least a building relationship and that activity has increased over the last few years. The same sorts of social controls that we see in China are being implemented in Venezuela via fatherland cards and other such things. And so we were able to trace the much of the activity in one election back to Venezuela. Beyond that, it, as everybody knows, it becomes very hard. It, the fact that we could even see where some of it came was, was probably um, fortunate in and of itself because it's so ubiquitous. And then from an adversary perspective, you add machine learning and artificial intelligence into this space. And we can quickly be overwhelmed by the, the generation of false narratives in cyberspace. And the, and the data that we rely on is com constantly at risk. When I sit down with my counterparts, and I just came back last week from Uruguay and Argentina, at the top of their list, it's in the top three of every chief of defense list is cyber. And they struggle with who, who should own it within their armed forces or their armed forces at, at all. And, and these are problems that we've worked very hard to overcome within the US military, as well as within the US government. So I can relate very much to the challenges that they face. Cyber is a joint. And so for any one service to own it means that no service, that not all their services, military services that is, will be able to avail themselves. Yet many countries, the capacity for this is, um, is at such stages that no one owns it. 
in their military. And so how do we help them with that challenge as we go forward? How do we help them overcome the lack of free and fair elections and the lack of free information flow? And a lot of this is not an inherent military function to reach out to a partner nation. It doesn't match well. Although I am pleased we finally got through the, the application of cyber as a traditional military application and, and it took some time when I was the CENTCOM J3, we were really challenged to, by that in, in terms of using cyber and MISO and other things uh, that uh, now I think Rich Clark talked to you about, we were able to move out with in some nascent um, capability that he hosts for all of us in Tampa. And so that challenge of how we match up uh, overseas leads me to what is a combatant command's role? So we've got the threat and the threats have been talked about at great length and I understanding the problem is, is a, a huge measure uh, solving. And I think it's Einstein who said 55 minutes to define the problem and then five minutes to solve it. But that five minutes of solving can be of equal weight in terms of difficulty is that problem definition. So from a COCOM perspective, I've divided it up this way. First, in our security cooperation, which is a term we use uh, to apply resources and tools to work with our partners to build their capacity. And it should be two-way, a partnership's two-way. I put my hand out, you put yours. We, we clasp it together and we get advantage, uh, US at advantage of them. And I think when we look at democracies and the worldwide cyber net, we can see advantage to free and fair elections, free and fair nations and the security of data, especially if we're gonna to work together in a military operation. So there is a one of those geeky acronyms that we use, a triple three program, 333. It happens to be the section in the law uh, was created in the National Defense Act of 2017. It does allow security cooperation in cyber. And it was like pulling molars without no, Novocaine to get that through the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and Congress. And we were finally able to get our first very nascent small dollar cyber training program uh, in place last year with one of our partners. We need to be looking at areas to smartly move that forward. It's good for the partners, it's good for us, and we will learn together. The second is, while there are some capacities through Cybercom, through some of the cyber protection teams that are afforded to COCOMs, that, that they're, it's, it's very, um, it's excellent capacity. It's useful in high-end defense type missions, uh, but it is not often what our partner needs. So last year during, before COVID, when we were visiting with uh, General Nakasone, Paul Nakasone, our two commands put our heads together and say, what would we, could we do within combatant command authorities to come up with an innovative solution in, in sending some capacity to a partner? In my head, being a ship driver, the model I use was on most ships, you don't have a dedicated firefighting force. So you create a fire team out of talented and willing volunteers and some ha and who have a baseline of skills. And there are a few in that force that probably are what we call damage controlmen that really know their stuff. So taking that model, we looked around the command and we've got cyber, talented cyber people. Some of them are double hatted doing other things. And we put together a team called, and I always have to look at the acronym here, we love our acronyms, but it's the Joint Combatant Command Cyber Assist Team, so JCCAT. And we've now deployed it to a number of countries. Um, and we can deploy it in short notice. Now, it's a, it takes people out of their regular jobs. We've received no additional funding for this. I, the size of the team is anywhere from 8 to 15, 16. And we have deployed it regularly during COVID because our partners want and need it so bad. And they look at basic cyber hygiene, frankly, the kinds of things that people get sloppy on, patches, uh, managing your software, managing your, your profiles, and, and things that, that we can do in what we call a subject matter exchange uh, up to two weeks long. We've just come in, coming off a couple, and I won't go into the countries that we've done it with, but the reports are written for release. And then I'm able to hand my counterpart a report that they can use nuggets from immediately. 
there's members of our state partners on these teams. So we leverage national guard skills, very key. There are members of our, our J38 here, which is our joint uh, cyber command uh, center team. We have also the COIPI, which is a cyberspace operations integrated planning element, which is a, the way that Cybercom has pushed capabilities to combatant command. We're at about 50% manning there. We were the last of the combatant commands to bring capability in there, but we pull members out of that. We pull members from our, our components. We pull members from the Department of Homeland Security and from the Coast Guard because the authorities in this space are so key and it's not an, a good and even match. We, one country we sent to, they don't have um, a military, they have a security service. So, and we work by, with and through our embassy. It has been a good best practice to emulate and model and we've only been working at it six months now. I'm very happy with it. I talked about the cyber protection teams. I talked about the state partnerships and these are all about building programs. That's security cooperation. Key role for us, an area we have to expand in. This is such a critical area. We have to build capability for our partners. And frankly, it, it helps us as well because it enhances our training and the, and the uh, talent of our team. The second is uh, defense. So we have uh, our network operations and security center here. Uh, again, the way the, it works in combatant commands, we were, I think the last to be able to get the resources to bring ours online, but it is online. It's about defending our networks, but we have to do something. And this is one of where I get to gaps at the end. We have to do something about the status of our networks. We have too many networks and they're too distributed. Why should, combatant commands and individual commands within the military, within, within our overall government have their own networks, or do we need to have less uh, surface area? I brought this sheet in. This is the spreadsheet of all the networks. This includes the things that we bought for partners using our security cooperation money over time. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's almost, humanly impossible to memorize all the networks on the sheet. Now I could have probably made it smaller. I didn't have them blow it up for dramatic effect here, but it's too much surface area. It's, uh, it's analogous to being in uh, pick a country and you have all these little forward operating bases and each one of them consumes a lot of uh, protective power to defend. Uh, is this the best way forward? And I would offer, we ought to look at concepts like the Air Force's Joint All Demand Command and Control as a way to fold in and aggressively fold in our disparate array of networks to in, ensure a better defensive perimeter and save money. Frankly, every line on this sheet, I have dollars written here and it's a different contract. People will fight that I'm sure, but we've got to move out. Security cooperation, defense. The third area of a combatant command's responsibility is in the intelligence area. And when I think cyber, I think big data and the explosion of data. The enemies, they steal it, they don't follow laws, they take it and they're using that in ways that uh, perhaps probably map the very truck that I drive, I'm sure of it. Uh, to us as a nation of laws, we have to differentiate whether it's foreign or domestic, decide who gets the right uh, level of play on that and then figure out how to buy it. And so we have to go out and buy it from companies at great expense. And I'm not suggesting we circumvent the laws. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. We need to embrace them. But what is our approach to doing that as a department, as US government, and then leveraging that data to learn for information sharing, intelligence and targeting and more. And this is where efforts like the Jake, uh, the joint all of Bain Intel Center, our, our uh, AI center, I'm sorry, in the Pentagon, the Jake and Project Maven are so critical and that we leverage that capability now and we build it, we use it as we build it instead of uh, waiting three palm cycles, build the requirements and they're already outdated. Security cooperation, defense and Intel. The fourth is planning. At the top of the list of what a combatant command is supposed to do by law is planning. And um, every, every person in our headquarters should have some basic planning skills. 
and planning is what we do as soon as something happens what's the problem what are the facts assumptions what can we do constraints what can't we do restraints and understanding cyber and being able to use it just like a ship driver can use a ship on the water or a infantry person can maneuver in the in the um, on the terrain is key and we don't we aren't there yet our basic level of knowledge is not caught up i don't think there's a a, a way that we're grasping the evolution of this in a sufficient manner to teach people as they go and the number of folks that really understand how to use the, the how to understand the technology, use it and apply it is, is not sufficient. The cyber planning, uh, the cyber operations integrated planning element, the COIPI as it's affectionately known is, is, is a great start, uh, but uh, it, will that be sufficient capacity as we move forward? And that's more of a question than answer. So down to what do we do about all this? One, we've got to have um, viable training that is shared and baked into everything we do that gets our level of knowledge up on, on cyber and its connection to everything, information, influence, data. Two, we've got to be all in on the data. The fact that the DOD now has a, a designated a data manager is, a, is the first step. It's a really shocking how far behind we are on that aspect of this terrain. Three, the talent piece of this, uh, there's never gonna be enough talent to go around in this piece, the space as we compete with commercial. So we have to carefully think about the distribution of talent. 11 combatant commands, cyber has the talent. So if you, if you say there's 10, then there's 10 of these coipies. At what point is the talent distributed too thinly to be of any advantage? Are we really organized correctly? It's, it's a question that took a long time to get to the current uh, solution, but one we need to continue challenging ourselves on going forward. I think that the talent growth is always gonna lag the need. And in the defense uh, world, we've got to think about how we connect that talent to commercial solutions, which gives me to the next way ahead is, is, a, is a better, more robust, public-private work share going forward in this domain. And that might not necessarily reside at the combatant command level, but places where it's working uh, in uh, the Defense Innovation Unit, Silicon Valley and the Jake uh, run by Lieutenant General Mike Grone are I think good starts, but again, getting that to the point where there's viable capacity there. So went through the COCOM, what, what I think our job is, what some of the things we are doing and what some of the friction points are in those. Security cooperation, ran through some of the elements. The most innovative thing we've done here and we were the first to go forward with it with General Nakasone's support. We didn't ask anybody other than General Nakasone. We did it within our own authorities was the JCCAT, the Joint Cyber, Joint Combatant Command Cyber Assessment Assistance Team. Um, went through defense and uh, you know, I think about all these networks as little fobs or big fobs that have their own security challenges. It's too much surface area, too brittle, too expensive. We've gotta, we've gotta do something as an enterprise there. We talked about Intel and the, the application of AI and machine learning and Intel. We, we, I didn't mention, but we have a couple pilot programs here in data in cryptocurrency and threat finance would show a lot of promise. And then planning, everybody has to be a planner. And then I pose some questions at the end. This is an important topic and I'm glad you all are taking it on and I look forward to some questions. <clears throat> Admiral Fowler, thank you very much uh, uh, for your comments. Um, let me do a little context uh, if I could before I launch into questions. Um, I'm currently responsible for heading up an organization called Cyber Florida, and that gives us the mission of expanded uh, education in cyber, cybersecurity, research, and outreach. And our principal focus is the 12, or are the 12 state university system institutions. We also have outreach to the other 28 state supported colleges, and uh, broadly, more broadly speaking, the K through 12 secondary schools across the, st the state. So some very ro robust programs. So uh, what we're interested in doing, how do we shape the focus and the, 
the uh, engagement of the faculty and the students that would cause you to benefit uh, from better skills of the kinds of things that you need. So I'd like, I would just ask you, uh, perhaps you wouldn't be ready to respond to that question now, but I just want to make the offer, uh, to put it in the old intelligence vernacular, you call, we haul. So if you'll let us know uh, how we could help or if you want help or how we could shape it or change the curriculum or the education, um, we'd certainly try to, to meet your needs because quite frankly, that's our mission. It's outreach, it's to support. And so we're having a similar dialogue with um, uh, General McKenzie at uh, uh, Central Command and uh, General Clark at Special Operations Command. Now, I wanna start with a hard question. <clears throat> and quite frankly, I think it may be difficult for you to even answer this question. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the reason is because you're active duty in the current seat you're in. But what we have been um, exposed to, it's been described over and over, and probably most eloquently yesterday by a former congressman, uh, uh, Representative Mike Rogers, who chaired the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He said, here's the problem currently with cyber um, vulnerability and penetration of the nation. Uh, first of all, there's, is it espionage or sabotage? And the point he made is it's only intent that matters because if you have access for espionage with remote control, then the difference between just exploiting the information, taking it, leaving no fingerprints, or destroying it is intent. And so the point he made is both Russia and China, very severe penetration of the country on the solar wind side, 18,000 different organizations and nine major departments of the federal government, and numbered in the 30,000 from the Chinese penetration of the uh, exploitation of the Microsoft Exchange flaw. And the way they launched those activities were from servers inside the United States. And here's where the hard question's coming to you. Currently, General Nakasone, the direct, director of the National Security Agency and the commander of Cyber Command, finds the fact that the Russians and the Chinese are in US servers inside the United States to launch their attacks, they're off limits. By law, they're excluded. That applies more to the US intelligence capabilities than uh, Cyber Command's capabilities because Cyber Command can do things in support of DOD on uh, what's called the, the Department of Defense uh, network. But everything else is off limits. So the question is, um, and I'm asking it because of your extensive legislative experience, is it time to change the authorities of the US intelligence community to assist in protecting the critical infrastructures of the country? I think that as a matter of first principle, we have to do uh, what's necessary uh, to protect that infrastructure and we have to do it in a manner that's evolved to the 21st century. And I think there are ways to get there. We, we can ensure uh, our citizens and our elected leaders and our commander in chief that we're doing it in accordance with the protections that are granted by the constitution. So I think if you, whenever you're confronted with a wicked problem, you start with first principles and then you figure out a path that can assure everybody that we can meet that uh, with the speed of relevance. I don't think it's, um, feasible to have mirror capability sets. There's not enough talent or money to have mirror capability sets to have one organization that just looks uh, offshore and one that looks onshore and the threats different. Those laws I, and many of them were written with a physical threat in mind and this is not. This is a, a threat that the enemy has intentionally figured out how to embed within the U.S. but operate from without. And so I I, I would just walk myself to your answer by following that logic. And so I, I, we've got to relook at this. It's a, we're, we're blocking our own field goals here in our ability to defend the nation and to ensure that our secrets, our technology, our industrial advantage, our economic advantage, our citizens' personal data is not stolen and exploited. I mean, how many... How many tens of millions of our, our personal data is, is now sitting in 
some um, artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm waiting for an external state adversary to uh, utilize an influence campaign to generate false public opinion to, to shift a, a US decision in the future. All of this is happening already. It's not a sci-fi movie. And, and that's why I appreciate your question, Mike. Mike, while, there, while we're there, I'll just say back on Cyber Florida, we're gonna follow up. I got uh, just off screen here, my good Colonel call sign MIG who runs uh, our J38. And we have a really robust intern program here with FIU University of Miami and others, but we don't currently have any cyber interns. And uh, I'm sure the HR people will tell me there's about 10 barriers, but I'm already over those barriers to yes. So we'll, we'll follow up, but back to you, Mike. Well, thank you, sir, very much. And <clears throat> we look forward to, to uh, talking with you and uh, I look forward to having a conversation with Colonel Mig and, and maybe we can work something out. Let, let me go to uh, my next question. Um, I, I've been focused on this topic for a, a number of years. I, had the privilege of serving as the new director of the National Security Agency in 1992. And if you'll remember that time frame, Cold War is over, uh, peace dividend gets smaller, uh, internet's exploding. So we had to rethink a lot of our, our process and our future and so on during that time frame. And I, I got very focused on um, uh, the make code side of NSA's mission and what we call today cybersecurity. And what I've been troubled by over the years I've followed this is you mentioned it, um, Admiral Fowler, uh, the talent gap. Uh, currently today, we are 500,000 short of the number of people that we need to fill existing cybersecurity jobs. And oh, by the way, if there's students out there listening and you have cybersecurity skills, you start at a premium of a higher salary than your colleagues, generally uh, 30, 40, sometimes 50, 60% higher salary if you can fill one of these jobs. The other point I would make is two out of every three U.S. government cyber jobs is unfilled. So, uh, Alan Fowler, I, you raised it as an issue for you. Uh, we're trying to focus on it here in Florida to produce more of them. Um, how are you thinking about addressing the talent gap going forward? Is it, a, is it an argument that you have to make through your normal defense process to increase your numbers? If, if your authorized billets are, are available, is there talent there to fill the billets? Mike, Mike, I don't have a good answer on this question. Um, the way we've stood up the last couple of combatant commands to stay in the cap joint billet or even the 25% headquarters reduction has best been to spread talent more thinly across the services and our own commands. Um, and uh, Space Command stand up is another example of that. So. That's not the answer. Um, and I don't think, you know, so I think the whole range of things would be something I would look at the balance between young, freshly educated, hungry, um, the balance between more senior, the uh, balance between veterans hiring versus talent. And, um, you know, I would argue probably you can't hire somebody off the street to drive a destroyer and command a destroyer. There's there's a lot there, but could you hire someone off the street to come in at a lateral level? And and I think those are all things I've heard discussed. There's no uh, new ideas there, but clearly we've got to look at uh, ways to enhance our our team in that regard and make sure it stays competitive. I do think when they when we allow the team to use their skills the uh, sense of mission that you get. We've worked through that here recently and some of the things we've done with uh, free and fair elections where people are actually utilizing their skills and, and really getting it done drives a, a mission accomplishment that, that does uh, keep people around. So that's something that you might not get somewhere else. So we, we, we've got to make sure we, we do have all this talent that we don't constrain their use. We allow them to do their job and and be innovative and plan and get involved and and do things in uh, in cyber and I, that was a problem for a while. I think we've moved out in a better way in the last few years, letting people work in this space appropriately. Uh, so you touched on this a bit, and I want to draw out that answer if I could a little bit more. I you used uh, the analogy: you don't hire uh, somebody to be in command of a destroyer, and, I, and it goes to something something I used to say often. People ask about the military about 
uh, middle grade officers. I said, well, you don't hire lieutenant commanders and commanders, you hire ensigns and you grow them into lieutenant commanders and commanders. So um, uh, General Crowell, uh, the Joint Com J6 was with us yesterday and he teed up uh, what I thought was a very interesting idea. He said, we have to recognize the, the available population who have skills and interests and oh, by the way, they have a willingness to serve, but not in uniform. I know my colleague, uh, Dr. Ron Sanders, has, uh, he's probably the most senior duty expert in human resources and DOD and other places that I've known. And he made uh, a concerted effort to create a program called Passports. Uh, that would be in, in, our, in our intelligence community, for example, um, someone could come in and serve three or four or five years because they wanted to serve. They could go to industry and earn an estate or whatever. And at some point they want to come back, then they would have a passport to come back. So we, we got that process authorized in law. So I'm asking you as a combatant commander, here you are responsible for the Southern hemisphere and uh, you have a, a set of issues and needs that you described in the cyber domain. Would you be receptive to having uh, the cyber support come to you by a workforce that is not in uniform, that is on civilian active duty to do the cyber kinds of jobs, but then would leave, maybe gone for some number of years, and then we'd come back in this sort of rotational sense. Is that a model that would be acceptable to you? Absolutely, I think it's a great idea. I, I find uh, Ten General Crawl to be an innovative uh, officer, and I, and I uh, place a lot of stock in his ideas. Uh, by way of connection, when I was the uh, CENTCOM uh, J3, he was my J39 uh, and uh, was running our joint cyber center. All right, so I, I knew there was a, a closed uh, circle here at some point. Let me, let me go in a new direction. Uh, I think we're probably getting toward the end of our time, but I wanna ask about area studies. One of the things that uh, impresses me about your command, the last time I had an opportunity to be in your location, um, Admiral Jim Stravitas was uh, uh, the Southcom commander, and we had an initiative that uh, uh, I was the NIC at the time. President Bush had approved it, so uh, we had an initiative that involved both Southcom and SOCOM in involving uh, Mexico, and we wanted to change the the, the dynamic and and so on. But uh, in that give and take over time, I had a better appreciation. Um, for your mission, uh, Central South America and so on. I, I'm a Cold War warrior, mostly Pacific or Atlantic and, and not much focus in that area, uh, in your area. So um, the question I'm leading into is I'm struck by the talent and abilities here resident in Florida with area expertise. Uh, so uh, is there any interest on your part um, and maybe you're doing this and I'm just not aware of it, but harnessing the area expertise of the various faculty members who speak the language, who know the area, who know all the personalities, would that be helpful to you in your mission performance as you go forward? Absolutely. We have a really uh, strong uh, ties to uh, FIU in particular uh, through the Kimberly Green Latin America Center there and we, through our uh, J2 and J5, we have at least once a quarter, at least once a month, but once a quarter, we have uh, an exchange program. And we also have uh, signed on with uh, FIU in, um, in an unclassified, I, I call it an unclassified library. So it's a data library. Uh, we're calling it an all domain awareness center. It's a little beyond what you're, you're speaking about, Mike, but uh, we have a we have an intern program that, that comes out of most of the interns here at the headquarters are either from FIU, uh, University of Miami, Florida State, University of Florida, but you know so the distance thing does matter. So I see a lot of FIU and generally we have up to about 30 at a time uh, through that, that pool. Uh, but anyway, as long as any way we can thicken that, we have a, a public private organization in our J79 and uh, uh, retired Colonel Paul Murray there that manages that and, and, and has us tie into all those entities. So I think 
and frankly, some of that I think does tie back to the good Admiral Jim Stavridis and and how we've continued to play that forward. But happy to have a discussion on how to how to thicken that because we're we're going to need more team solutions for the wicked problems that uh, that are on the horizon. And uh, just as an example, the Inter American Defense College or and the Inter American Defense Board in Washington are also looking at cyber. And uh, and I was up and spoke with them a few weeks ago and how do we work together uh, across countries and, and, and within the hemisphere to get better sustainable solutions. Back to you, sir. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear your interaction with uh, FIU. They're one of the 12 uh, SUS um, institutes. I'm sure you're aware of that. And Brian Fonseca there is a good friend and, and partner that we work with uh, quite a bit. Uh, but if there is a, a broader window for that kind of expertise, uh, we can certainly uh, make it available. I, we're getting close to the end, uh, uh, Admiral Fowler. And I, and I just, the point I would like to make in closing uh, having been a military guy for most of my professional life, there's nothing like commander's intent. So from my side, we're trying to make the state university system more supportive of our combatant commanders, whatever they need. And if the commander's intent, you, uh, General McKenzie, General Clark, is to uh, examine what we can do to help and be robust about that, and you communicate that to your staff, we'll be the first to be there to sign up to have that dialogue because we're, we're very interested in how we could be uh, more supportive of your efforts. It's, uh, it's vital work. Uh, we are all are supportive and we don't wanna interfere, but if there's energy and talent and capability that we can make available to you, we certainly wanna do that. So thank you very, very much for participating in this conference, sir. Mike, thanks. We'll absolutely take you up on that. Sounds like you wrote my commander's intent with respect to that. Uh, the outreach, the the network, building the networks is so important. Uh, there's the, the wicked problems demand uh, complex uh, solutions, frankly. Well, trying to get them to simple solutions, but this, that's not always the case. And getting the minds of uh, our academic team and our community particularly here in florida it's my fifth florida tour so i'm well familiar with uh, the strengths of this wonderful military friendly state and its great institutions and workforce so we're all in look forward to reaching out and, uh, and trying to figure out how we can move that forward and it also has the added benefit of telling our story of what we're doing and why it's important and uh, we all have an obligation to do that uh, going forward as uh, we we try to stay connected, the military to the United States of America and the population. And, and this hemisphere, you mentioned Cold War, uh, this hemisphere often is the last that folks think about. And I view it right now, um, Mike, as a front line of competition with China. And you look at the tremendous amount of activity that's shifting, that's shifting beneath our feet, the economic, the information domain, IT, uh, the advantage this hemisphere has, it's positive water ratio, 30% of the globe's water with 8% of the globe's population. It's, it just flipped that around when you look at China. Uh, that water is uh, navigationable rivers, it's soy, it's cattle. That water's people, human capital, and China sees all that. You know, we don't see bases yet, but we see places and faces and influence, and we've got a navigate that way forward in a, in a manner that doesn't result in open conflict. I feel that we're already at conflict in cyberspace. Thanks for the time. Really important. Nice to see you virtually. Sir, really appreciate it. Take care.